Joyful, joyful, we adore you, O God, our Father in heaven and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to our worship service here at Harlandale Christian Church. We're, we're glad that you're uh, sharing with us in this Christmas season, this Advent season. Today we celebrate the joy that the Christ child, Jesus, brings to us and to the world. The psalmist in Psalm 126 speaks of the joy that the Lord uh, brings to his people when he restores his people, even as he has done for us in re forgiving our sins and uh, restoring our relationship with him through our Savior, Jesus. Psalm 126, verses 1 through 3 remind us, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of heaven and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's worship our God and our, our Savior in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here among us, here in worship. We thank you for your presence in our hearts, in our lives every single day. And today we thank you for bringing us joy. Joy because you provide for us, you protect us, you offer us salvation through the gift of your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, the babe who's birth we celebrate this Christmas season. Thank you, Father, for giving us hope, for giving us peace, for bringing us joy. Receive our worship and praise today, Father, as we lift up your name and lift up the name of our Savior Jesus. We honor you. We love you because you first loved us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven. Then 
and wise men from a country far looked up and saw a guiding star. They traveled on.
As we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this Christmas season, it's even more important for us to gather at the Lord's table, to share in this communion time, knowing that God came into this world in the, the form of that baby, Emmanuel, God with us, taking upon himself the form, the fashion, the likeness of man, yet still being God divine, so that he could give himself as the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to offer us salvation, to offer us forgiveness of our sins, to offer us remission of sin, and to offer us a hope of eternity in heaven with him, with God. Forgiveness, the ultimate gift that comes from the gift of God to us, his son, Jesus. As we partake of the bread and the cup today, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us and remembering the hope that is ours when we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, our song of communion and meditation is Amazing Grace, My Sins Are Gone. We'll sing this song and meditate upon the words as we partake of this bread and this cup. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your gift, your gift of your son Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us in flesh, in likeness of man. Thank you for your plan of salvation in which your, your son grew to be a man still sinless, but took our sins upon him, himself, and went to the cross and offered his flesh, his blood, in the sacrifice to bring us salvation. Father, as we look forward to gifts in this Christmas season, thank you for your greatest gift of all, peace with you, hope of eternal life, joy with you because of your amazing grace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Dissolve like snow 
Well, I'm glad that you're joining us today to worship and during this Christmas season. We're in the middle of a sermon series called The Promise. And so far, we've discovered several promises of God that are fulfilled in the birth of His Son, Jesus Christ. The Christmas season is when we celebrate all that is available to us through the gift of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. All through this season of Advent, we learn to expectantly wait in hope, peace, joy, and love. Two weeks uh, uh, weeks ago, we we discovered that God promised, his, His promised hope came in the form of one person. Jesus meets our deepest longings, and, and He's the hope for our present and for our future. Last week, we looked at the promise of peace that was given to the lowly shepherds. There would come a new government that would uh, bring peace to the world and to the Jewish people. Today, we're taking a look at the third theme of Advent, joy. You know, Christmas is, is truly the most wonderful time of the year. I love everything about it. I love getting together with friends and family to celebrate. I love eating the Christmas meal, and of course, I love those Christmas desserts. I love looking at the the Christmas lights and enjoying the, the festivities of the season. But what I love the most is giving gifts to others. 
I know that many people look forward to opening presents and, and seeing what's under the tree for them, but it's always brought me more joy to see others open gifts that I've picked out for them, wrapped up and laid under the tree. The problem is I'm not the most patient person in the world. And sometimes it seems I'm the worst about doing my Christmas shopping. And I always want to let my family open their gifts early. I just get so excited to share what I picked out for them. In fact, this past week, I gave one early Christmas present. And uh, the recipient of it was so overjoyed. So it takes everything within me to remain patient, to make it the proper time to wait until it's time to open the gifts. You know, when somebody finds joy in something, it's hard to hide it. The things that bring you joy are the things that you want to share with the world. It's just in our nature to want others to share that happiness that we have. It's no wonder then that we find in Scripture that God is eager to share the joy of Christ's birth even before it was time for his son, Jesus, to arrive. Joy is not something that we can keep to ourselves, especially here at Christmas time. The incarnation, which is Jesus' birth, or God coming to earth as a human being, is the greatest gift that's ever been given to all of humankind. It's better than the invention of the sandwich. Or the printing press. And yes, better than pumpkin spice latte. You can almost sense God's excitement for the, the hope, peace, joy, and love that would come through the, the arrival of his son, Jesus. In thinking about this theme of joy, the scriptures point us three specific lessons that I'd like to point out today. The first is, Jesus' birth is the source of true joy. You know, the, the book of Isaiah speaks to this coming gift. There's a prophetic word given about someone who would come to prepare the world for the arrival of Jesus. And this passage in the book of Isaiah was written hundreds of years before it was fulfilled. And it's one of God's joyful promises about the future. Read with me, if you will, from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. Isaiah says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here in Isaiah 40, God promises that there will be a time of preparation before Christ's birth, before the birth of the Messiah. There will be a straightening out and a leveling that will take place that ensures that the glory of God in Jesus will be made available to all people. You know, when I read these verses, I can sense the joy that God has to share, that he wants to bring this joy with, to the whole world. He wants to share that what once was broken by sin will be made right. Friends, the truth is that that preparation is key to fully enjoying any great event. This promise in the Old Testament is that the people of God will see this preparation take place. God doesn't want them to miss it because it's the signpost for what's to come. Any barriers that are in the way of experiencing the joy of this miraculous birth are removed. There is no desert, no mountain, no valley, no rugged place that will stand in the way of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We come across a character in the New Testament named Zechariah. 
He's a priest who serves in the temple of God. And we find him in the temple burning incense in worship while people are praying outside. We focus today on Luke chapter 1. So if you want to turn to Luke 1, we'll read verses 11 to 17. Luke 1, verse 11 through 17. Luke records, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, when Zechariah was serving in the temple, suddenly this angel of the Lord was speaking to him. He was startled. He was gripped with fear, but like any of the other interactions with angels in the Christmas stories, the first word that was given to him is, do not be afraid. Apparently, Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, had been praying for, uh, for a child, and their prayers are being answered. They will give birth to a son, and the angel says they are to name him John. The angel says he will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. This child will be filled with the Spirit of God and he will be kept free from wine and fermented drink because he would take a Nazarite vow to serve God all of his life. These vows kept him from drinking alcohol and cutting his hair or coming in contact with dead bodies. Clearly, This boy, this child was special. And God had plans to use him to bring joy to his family and to the entire world by the way that he would live. Because of his life, there would be many who who would be brought back to the Lord. Because of his life, he would prepare people for something even more wonderful that was about to happen. You can see the connections between that Isaiah passage and this story in Luke in verse 17. This baby will prepare the people for the arrival of the Lord. John will be a joy to his family and a joy to the whole world because he will be the one calling in the wilderness and making a way for the arrival of the Son of God. Which brings us a second point. It's a joy to prepare others to experience God. One of the greatest joys of our Christmas season is the opportunity that we're given to prepare the way for others to see Jesus for who he really is. The most joyful people during this time of the year are the ones who've experienced the hope and the peace and the joy of God in their lives because of their trust in Jesus, the Messiah the Christ, the way they speak to others, the way they serve others, the way they treat others are all a means of preparing the way for other people to meet Jesus. This joy is a commodity that's in short supply in our world today. There are people all around us who are miserable. They're in over their heads with their involvement in sin. They're heartbroken over the pain of life. They're hopeless in the face of suffering. Now, now is the time for us to share the joy of Jesus with the world. It's said that Arthur Leo Bascaglia tells this story about his mother and their misery dinner in one of his books. It was about the night after his father came home and said it looked as if he would have to to 
file bankruptcy because his partner had absconded with their firm's money, the funds. His mother went out and sold some of her jewelry so that she could go find food, buy food for a great feast. Other members of the family scolded her for doing that, but she told them that the time for joy is now. When we need it most, not next week. And her courageous act rallied the family. Her sacrifice instilled a newfound joy in the downtrodden. By the mother giving up what she valued, her family ate together and found strength from one another to never, ever give up. Friends, what's one way that you can sacrificially bring joy to those around you, especially this season? How can your life be a beacon of hope because of your love for Jesus? You know, that's what John's call for his life was. And it's the, our call for our life in Christ as well. So Zechariah's response to this message given to him by the, the angel comes with a consequence. We read of this consequence in Luke 1 verses 18 through 20. Old Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. You see, Zechariah is skeptical of this good news given to him by this angel, Gabriel. He and his wife, Elizabeth, are old, and the prospect of having a child was pretty slim. Because of his unbelief and distrust, he's silenced and unable to speak until the time comes for John, the ba their baby, to be born. You know, even though the, the good news of a, a God who comes to us in the flesh to rescue us might seem too good to be true, our response should be marked by deep faith and joy. Friends, when we trust God, we can share it with others. So fast forwarding to the birth of this promised boy, all the family had gathered together to share in this miraculous birth. Here's, here's something for you to, to remember. Elizabeth is actually a cousin of a woman named Mary. That Mary happens to be a woman who's also pregnant and will soon give birth to a boy. And that boy will be named Jesus. So Jesus and John are cousins. And from the time that they were in their mother's womb, they were connected by the Spirit of God. So the time has come for John to be born into the world. And we read in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 57, this account. Luke 1, 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Verse 61, they said to her, wait, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. So he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Verse 64. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wonder, this who everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, "What then is this child going to be?" For the Lord's hand was with him. 
So when this baby was born, there's a familiar discussion that takes place. It takes place every time a baby is born, isn't it? What to name this new baby? And everybody expected them to name him after his father, Zechariah. But both Elizabeth and Zechariah agreed that his name was to be called John, just as the angel foretold and the angel instructed him. You know, John's name in the Greek means graced by God, or Jehovah has been gracious. This name that is given to the boy speaks volumes to the joy that surrounds his life. God has been gracious to Elizabeth and Zechariah by giving them a son. God also has been gracious because through John's life and his work, the world will be prepared for the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Which brings us our third lesson, our third point. Our joy comes from the grace of God of God. The, the relatives all celebrated John's birth and they, they shared in Elizabeth's joy and excitement and, and happiness. John's life is surrounded by joy and that joy is in the Lord's work among them. Zechariah is still unable to speak but he writes the name John in agreement with his wife Elizabeth. And upon is Zechariah being obedient to the angel's message and to God's will, he's once again able to speak. His first response, rejoicing and praising God. When the word spread about John's amazing birth and Zechariah's recovered speech, everybody over the Judean countryside was in awe and they wondered what amazing things John would do with his life. And of course, you and I, we now know that John the Baptist went on to prepare the way for Jesus, to baptize Jesus, and to die a martyr's death for speaking truth to the ruling authority in his time, in his life. John was full of the spirit of truth, and he rejoiced in serving God, the Father. The grace that covered John's birth and life is the same grace that is given to us free of charge. We could never earn God's grace. It's a gift that's given to us through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. So friends, we should be people marked by joy because of this grace from God, this grace that he's given to us. When we live our lives from this place, word spreads quickly and people are in awe of the miraculous birth of Christ at Christmas. I would ask, are you someone who displays joy? Are you someone who knows the joys that come at Christmas? Are you someone that rejoices in the face of adversity? I would also ask, what's one way that you can display this good news of this season by the way that you live your life? What's one way that you can bring the joy of Christ to the people around you in this Christmas season? What's one way that you can let people know that Jesus is the Son of God? That Jesus is the reason for this season. That Jesus is our source of joy and hope and peace. Our song of decision and dedication today is one that says, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? what Jesus would do. Mary, did you know what Jesus would be? Mary, did you know? Do you know that same Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy that you bring to us through your son, Jesus. 
Even in this Christmas season, we turn to you, we look to you, even in the times of suffering and turmoil and adversity, we want your joy. We want your joy to shine out of us and pour out of us to others around us so that others, like Zechariah, can expect your presence, your joy, your peace in their lives. Father, today we take time to remember that joy that comes through the birth of your son, Jesus. We can't find fulfillment in any other person or any other thing. This Christmas, God, may we rejoice in the good news of a God who came near to us in the form of a baby, who died for us so that we might live redeemed through him. Oh God, may the eternal joy that we find in Jesus bring us ever closer to you. Thank you, God, for sharing your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Your baby boy would come a story.